Hey everybody, my name is Jason, also known as Pirate JC, and welcome to another Babylon video. Today, I'm pretty pumped because I get to share with you where the pirate obsession all originated from in a small little Babylon scene. That's right, today we're gonna start two different videos that all culminate with this awesome little Lego pirate scene. Super, super fun, super, super cute. This is where it all started for me when I was a small little boy, my parents got me a Lego pirate set and something just clicked in my imagination and pirates has been my, uh, my obsession ever since. But of course, we're not here to talk about pirates, we're here to talk about Babylon and what in Babylon is enabling this scene to happen. So we're gonna do two different videos. The first video, we're gonna focus on the water and then the second video, we'll focus on some tricks to make that boat kind of procedurally rock like that. Pretty awesome. Uh, so actually, the place that we're gonna start is by talking about Thin instances, okay? That's the power behind what's happening with that, that water, that, those water studs. Think about a mesh. Think about adding a mesh to your scene. Now, in that mesh, uh, you can copy it, of course, multiple times if you really wanted to. And when you copy that mesh, you can, of course, have all kinds of things that you can do with it. But that may not be the most performant thing in the world to do. In fact, in this case, when we want to have a ton of copies of something, something that have the same material, the same geometry, then there's a trick or, or a tool in Babylon that you can use called thin instances. And essentially what that is, is rather than copying a mesh a whole bunch of times, you can instead say, hey, GPU, hey, that graphical processing workhorse that all machines have, I want you to do all of the hard work. I don't want to copy it. I just want you to draw this mesh multiple times. And of course, it can have the same material. And if that material is procedural based on the world position, and we're rendering something in different places of the world, then it can have a different looking effect on it. But the GPU is the thing that's doing all of that work. And so that's what we're going to focus on in this first video is all about thin instances. So you can follow along at this playground here. This is where we're going to start. If you look down in the description of this video uh, down below, you can actually find a link to this exact starting uh, playground. Okay. And this playground is essentially just a camera with, a, with physics enabled that'll help us later. Um, and that camera has a few limits on it and a special position, uh, and some environment uh, uh, texture, uh, excuse me, uh, an environment lighting, and then of course uh, just a uh, hemispheric light. And so this is where our fun is actually going to start right here. We are going to hit control space to load in a mesh. Now control space brings up the playground templates. If you're not familiar with this, playground templates are awesome. They're small little snippets of code that you might use on a regular basis whenever you're using Babylon. I use them all the time. And the first one we're going to use is import a mesh with callback. Okay. The mesh we want to load, it's going to be called stud. It's going to be located on the uh, Babylon, uh, in the Babylon assets repository in, uh, in GitHub. And we're going to access it like this. Uh, we're going to say Babylon uh, js.github.io and it's going to be assets slash meshes. Okay. And then we're going to say the name of that mesh, which is in this case stud.gl. GLB, there we go. And I'm gonna hit play and you should see a stud load in and we do. There's our first starting Lego stud that we're of course then going to tell the GPU to render multiple times. But before we do that, I just wanna do a tiny bit of cleanup. You'll notice that our GLB model comes in with this root node that I don't particularly want. I like to clean that up. Because we're loading with a callback, that means there's a function that will execute once the mesh is fully loaded. So right here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a variable called parent. This will be that, that root node. And we're going to say this is going to be new meshes. And it's going to be the very first thing that's returned in new meshes. Okay. Then we're going to say we want the stud to be parent.getChildMeshes. And we want the very first thing that's returned there as well. Uh, so getting child meshes is a method that gets all of the meshes underneath a given uh object if there are child meshes. And of course, because there's only one, because there's only this stud, that's the one that we're interested in. So here, now what we're going to do is we're going to say stud.setParent. 
and I want that to be equal to null. This is a helper function that uh, takes all of the world scale, uh, translation, position, rotation, all of that, and preserves it for you, and then copies it in. Uh, so using set parent as opposed to dot parent is a, definitely a trick to learn here. And then, of course, we want uh, to dispose of that original uh, parent, which we don't want anymore. So we'll hit play. And now what we have is... Uh, that stud by itself. Fantastic. Okay, so now let's get into some of the fun stuff now that we've cleaned that up just a little bit. We're going to uh, actually create the thin instances right here. We're going to get right into it. And we're going to start with three variables. The first one is going to be called ocean size, okay? And we're going to set that to be equal to 64 for right now. The second variable is going to be called stud distance. This is, I'm going to set this to nine. This is the distance between the studs. As we go out and create this big grid, this is the distance between them. I found nine is, is the right size for me based on this particular mesh that, I, that we're using. And then finally, we're going to have something called stud array, which is going to be an empty array for now, but we will populate later with all of the matrices for all of the positions uh, for all of our uh, studs, okay? All of the, the C of, of studs where we want the GPU to render them. All right. So now comes the fun part. We're going to create a nested loop. Actually, going to be two loops, one nested inside the other one. So the first thing that we're going to do is create this for loop, and we're going to create a variable called x. So we're going to go through and we're going to create, uh, in this case, ocean size, 64 columns. And then inside each column, there will be 64 rows, and we'll end up with our grid. Okay. So we want x, we want the starting position to be at basically where, where we're starting um, the essentially the C to be from. We could start at zero. The problem with starting at zero is that if we start both X, our columns and our rows, X and Z at zero, then the entire C will be only in the X and Z positive uh, space relative to world origin. And actually what I want is I kind of want this C to be centered around world origin. So in order to do that, I'm going to say that I actually want half of the uh, columns to be on the negative side of X and half of them to be on the positive side of X and the same with Z. So to do that, we'll start with negative one half of our ocean size, okay? So we're gonna say negative one uh, times, and then I'm going to say ocean size divided by two. Now, then I'm going to say, we're gonna continue to, to increment X until we get to the half of the ocean side on the positive side. So this is going to be, we're going to continue to do this until, uh, well, x is less than ocean size divided by two. And then finally, we're going to increment x by one every single loop. Now, here's the cool part. This is the exact same code that we're going to want for our nested loop as well. So we're going to take that, we're going to copy it, tab over, but this time, anytime that we see x, we're going to replace that with z. So here we go, z and Z. And now essentially what we have is a perfectly centered grid of where we want relative to world origin of where we're going to want all of these uh, studs to exist. So now let's actually create the location for each stud. So we're going to say let matrix equal Babylon dot matrix dot translation. And we're going to say we want X multiplied by the stud distance for Y. We don't need anything. We can do zero. Y is going to be completely driven by a procedural node material, which is going to be awesome. And then uh, we're going to uh, do same thing for Z uh, that we did for X, which is Z multiplied by stud distance. Awesome. Now we're going to take that individual. So, so basically we'll go through, we'll create, you know, first X column. Uh, then we're going to say we're going to loop through ocean number of times, ocean size number of times for X and create a new location. Then we're going to go to the next X, so forth and so on, until we have a 64 by 64 grid. So here what we're going to do is we're going to say we need to take that new uh, position, essentially, that, that matrix that we've created, and we're going to add that to the stud array. Okay, so we're going to say stud array dot push. And we're going to push in the matrix. And then finally, once the loop is done, so by the time both of these loops finish, we'll have that 64 by 64. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say stud dot thin instance add, and we're going to add in stud array. And it is that simple. Now we hit play, and you can see that we have an entire ocean of studs. But again, this is thin instances. And what's so incredible about this is there's only one mesh. Even though we're seeing tons of them, there's only one that's in the scene. Check this out. When we open up the scene, uh, the nodes, 
inside of the inspector, there's only one stud here. In fact, if I turn it off, if I tell the GPU you can't render this stud anymore, guess what? They all go away. Because all Thin Instances is doing is it's saying, hey, GPU, you need to render this mesh in these positions as many times as I tell it to, or we tell it to. So it's an amazing, amazing performance tool. In fact, when you think about the limitations of doing heavy graphics processing inside of the web, this is such an amazing thing to be able to save yourself performance. Such an amazing thing. And performance is something that obviously we care about. Okay, so at this point, we have thin instances, we have our ocean created, but now of course we wanna move it. And what we're gonna do here is shift gears into creating a node material that will function as the movement for all of these. And this is gonna be a bit of a journey, but we're gonna do it together. You can start by going to your browser and going to a brand new tab and typing in NME, that stands for node material editor .babylonjs.com. And that's what I'm doing here. And we're gonna go ahead and just get right to work. We're gonna grab these three nodes and we're gonna drag them way out here. We're gonna need tons and tons of space for this. So I just wanna give myself, um, yeah, lots of real estate. I'm gonna get rid of this color node, bring the fragment shader all the way over here. And our entire effort here in this, uh, creating this node material, it starts with adding a simplex Perlin 3D node, okay? And it takes a seed, which we're gonna use from this world position node, and we're gonna pipe that right on into our fragment shader. I'll get myself uh, out of the way here so you can see this, but there you go. That is the uh, noise being uh, driven into the fragment output, okay? It's actually coloring um, what the mesh will look like. Uh, so we, of course, want to modify this. We uh, want to have some control over this noise. The easiest thing to start with is the scale of the noise. Uh, how tight or how wide is that noise? So we'll grab a scale node. Before we actually pipe this into uh, the simplex Perlin 3D node, we're gonna take the uh, world position XYZ output and we're just gonna multiply that by a variable. Now our variable here, we're just gonna call it noise scale. And uh, I will set an initial value here of, I don't know, two, let's just call it two. Uh, and so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna just drag this right on over into the simplex uh, Perlin 3D node and watch it change. Boom, it just uh, effectively looked like it zoomed out a little bit. Uh, and of course we can uh, make that crazy. Uh, we can you know go really, really far out or get really, really close if we really wanted to, uh, to have really big noise. Uh, in this case, I think for us something around maybe like 1.4, uh, maybe, maybe a, yeah, 1.3 looks about right. Okay, so uh, now we have the ability to scale our noise, which is awesome. But of course, the next thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to move, right? We wanted to kind of undulate like the ocean does. Uh, and so to do that, we're gonna get out one of my favorite uh, nodes of all time, which is the ability to use time. We're gonna multiply time by a new variable. That variable is gonna allow us to have uh, control for speed. So you guessed it, we're going to call this noise speed. Uh, and again, this just allows us to have a multiplier. We'll stay an initial value of 1.4 maybe. Um, and that's basically us just saying we want to go faster than normal time or slower than normal time. Uh, and so we will uh, we'll use that. So now what we want to do is we want to take that time and we want to subtract it from the x, y, and z values. Okay, so we're going to need a vector splitter node. Here, again, we're gonna drag our noise over. Tons of real estate, we don't need to worry too much about this, but I'm gonna take the output of the scale uh, node, pipe that into the vector splitter, okay? And then I'm gonna need three subtract nodes, one for each of our X, Y, and Z uh, um, values. Okay, so I'm gonna copy and paste this. So I have X, Y, and Z. I am going to, let's get these guys out of the way here. And I'm going to take X, Y, and Z and put them into the left inputs, okay? Those are gonna go into the left inputs. And then the output of our little time multiplication here, that's gonna go into the right inputs of these subtract nodes, just like that. And now we need to connect that up into this simplex Perlin 3D node, except you'll see that it requires a vector three. So of course we need to combine all these back into a vector three, which we can do with a vector merger node. So we'll pipe X into X, Y into Y, and Z into Z. 
and we'll take the XYZ output and we're gonna put that into the Simplex Perlin 3D input, the seed input. And of course, now we have actual moving noise, which is awesome. That's really, really cool. But of course, we're not done yet. We want to add more control. We wanna be able to control the direction of where that noise is aimed, right? Where, basically, which way is it headed? If we were to look at this plane from overhead, is it north, south, east, uh, west? Where do we want it to go? So uh, to do this, we're gonna use a trick that I've used in another video. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it in this video, but essentially we're gonna take pi, and then we're going to take the sine and cosine of pi, and we are going to um, then pipe that into, uh, multiply it, use it as a multiplier against x and z. So essentially what happens here is when, you know, the sine is one, the cosine will be zero. So when x is one, z will be zero. When z is one, x will be zero and everything in between. And so we'll be able to kind of uh, move it around of how much x and how much y there is. Uh, and for the video that we've done on that, you can check down in the description down below where we talk in depth about how to use this trick. But it all starts with a couple of float nodes. So we'll drag those out down here. Uh, the first one is gonna be pi, as I mentioned. So we'll just call it pi. We'll give it that initial value, actually the only value of 3.14. It's gonna be a constant, okay? So because this is a constant, uh, that, that'll just save some performance in the calculation of the shader, which is good in our case. We're always trying to think about being as optimal as we can with performance. And then this one is gonna be called noise direction, okay? Now noise direction is gonna be between negative one and one, doesn't matter what the initial value is. I'm gonna multiply these together so I can have between negative pi and pi, which will be the, uh, the outcome of this. So we'll hook that up there. Good, and now I wanna go get both a sine node and a cosine node and drag those out uh, and hook the multiplies up into their inputs, just like this. Okay, now what I wanna do is I wanna take the uh, X and Z values uh, that are coming into the noise and I wanna multiply those by uh, the sine and cosine. So I'm gonna grab two more multiply nodes here and I'm gonna hook the sine into this first one, into the right of this first one, the cosine into the right input of this second one, and then the x from up here is gonna come down into the left input of this top multiply, and the z goes into the left input of this bottom multiply node. Okay, now then that functions as our new x and z going into our subtract nodes. So we'll grab these, we'll drag them over here like this, Y is unaffected, but we'll take this new X and put it up here and this new Z and put it over here. And now what you should be able to see is uh, we can uh, actually use this um, uh, noise direction variable to actually control the direction of where that, no that noise is headed. So uh, let's uh, click on this and we'll just move this. And so here's maybe where our noise was kind of originally headed, uh, which was towards that like bottom right corner. But I of course can move this any direction I want. I think something for me might be nice somewhere in like that kind of a range. I want it kind of flowing towards that bottom left corner. Uh, and so there we go. So now we have uh, noise that we can uh, change how the scale of the noise, how fast the noise is moving and the direction in which the noise is headed. So this is awesome. This is really getting some where now we're gonna take that and we're going to actually modify the height of our um, mesh here in this case uh, based off of that height. And to do that, it's really, really simple. We'll just uh, go up to um, our uh, original world position. We're gonna add another vector splitter and a vector merger, both. Uh, the vector splitter is gonna get hooked up to the output here, okay? The vector merger, we're gonna take X, Z, and W and, and pipe them right across because Y, we're gonna overwrite uh, the value of Y with the, the value of noise. Okay, so uh, forgive me, I'm not being super clean in my node graph here, just trying to move super, super quickly. So uh, definitely take the time to do this, uh, do this yourself. Pause the video at any time and make sure that this is clean and organized visually for yourself. Uh, so what we'll do now is we'll take the uh, Simplex Perlin 3D um, output, we'll pipe that into Y. And then the final piece is we need to hook that up into our world position view projection node. Okay, and that is gonna look like that. And of course, now uh, you can actually see that the mesh is moving kind of according to this procedural noise, uh, simplex noise that we've created, which is, which is awesome. Okay, we're almost ready to hook this up into our code. But before we do, 
the color of what we're looking at here, the fragment shader, is basically just the same thing as the noise. And we actually don't want that. We want the a PBR material. So we're going to pull out a PBR metallic roughness, okay? This is a, a very special node that allows you to hook PBR up into your node materials, right? Which is huge. And we're going to take um, the world position uh, that's coming out of here. And we're going to pipe that into world position. We're going to go get the world normal. Okay, I can type. There we go, world normal. Uh, we'll drag that out. It'll hook a couple of things up uh, upstream. We'll take that output and hook it into the world normal there. We're going to take out the base color. We're going to drag out from there. We're going to give this a kind of a dark blue with the particular HDR lighting um, that I'm uh, using. We're going to want a, a bit of a darker blue. Something maybe like that would look good. For metallic and roughness, we're going to have zero for both. So I don't want this to be metallic because Lego bricks are... Um, of course, plastic, and then uh, we want them to be super, super smooth. So we want them to have high re reflectivity of the environment. And then, of course, speaking of reflectivity, the last thing is we're going to pull out this reflection node, which wants the texture that it should reflect based on, um, you know, the camera uh, where, where the camera position is. So, um, okay, to do this, we're going to use the exact same HDR uh, image that we're using in our scene. In fact, the way we can actually do this is um, over here under source, we're going to say turn off embed static texture. We don't want that. We want to load this as a cube texture and it wants a link. So we can go back to our playground and we can go over here and this uh, environment texture right here, this HDR cube texture, this is what we're going to copy. We're going to bring this over. Um, I found this HDR image on HDRI Haven. Uh, you can find a link for that in the description down below. Amazing resource to go get all kinds of cool free HDRs. If you want to use this particular one, you're welcome to use it. It's in the GitHub um, assets repository under environment. So I'll copy this, the path to this, go back to our node material, and I'm going to put it right in there and hit enter. Okay, now it's not going to affect anything yet. I want to take the output of the lighting of this metallic uh, PBR metallic roughness, and I want to hook that into the fragment shader. Uh, and so um, you're not really seeing anything uh, at the moment. Um, there's nothing super uh, impressive happening yet. We're going to go through the effort of actually hooking this up into our code. Uh, and then we're going to start to see it evolve much more quickly from there. Okay, So this is a definitely a good place uh, for us to save and then start to get that into our code. So to do that, we're going to use this save as unique URL button. Okay, We're going to click that. And when we click that, it'll give us this awesome, unique hash. And we're going to use this hash. We're going to copy this. We don't want the pound sign before it, just the, uh, the, the letters and numbers, and go back to our code. And then in the uh, import mesh callback function, once we've loaded our stud, right here, we're going to hit control space. And there is, of course, a playground template that we can use for load from a node material with uh, from the snippet with a callback. And that's, of course, what we're going to want. Control paste, that's the hash to the unique node material that we've created. Hit tab, and now we can type in the name of the, uh, the mesh in the scene that we want to apply that node material to. And so in this case, it's just stud. And so now I'm going to hit play, and we're going to watch some magic happen together. Are you ready? Boom! OK, wait. It totally broke. And that is completely expected. The node material that we set up is about driving vertices with noise. But of course, we don't want to drive vertices with noise. We want to drive instances with noise. So we have a little bit more work to do. To show you what's happening here a little bit more visually, I'm going to do something. You don't need to do this at home. I'm just going to do this real quick to show you um, what we're actually seeing. Okay, I'm going to say camera.setTarget. Uh, and I'm going to set that to the world origin. Uh, so I'm going to do babylon.vector3.0. Okay, and that'll be our, our, our world origin there. Okay, I'm going to hit uh, play. And I'm going to zoom in here uh, really close. Can I zoom in? Uh, let's try that again. Uh, should be working. Vector3. Oh, oh, I see what I did. I see what I did. There we go. <laughs> Forgot my closing parentheses. Happens all the time. Okay, now we hit play. Now I can zoom in nice and close. Sorry about that. Okay, so what we have here, what you're looking at, is 64 by 64 rendered versions of our Lego stud. Each one of those has a node material attached to it that, based on its world position, is going to move the vertices of that particular instance of the mesh 
driven by procedural noise. I know that's crazy. I know that's a lot. The problem here is that we want that to affect the instances as a whole, not the vertices of the instances, okay? We want the whole thing to move, each, each stud to move as a whole object. We don't want their vertices to move independently. So here's what we're gonna do at this point, okay? I'm gonna undo what I've, uh, what I've done here, my little debug trick to show you uh, what was happening. I'll hit play again. And I'm gonna go over to our previous tab that had our node material, I'm gonna close it. We don't need it anymore, okay? Because now that we're loading our node material, it's right here in the inspector. I can hit this little pencil and bring up the uh, node material, okay? We've got our uh, HDR image uh, loaded, our texture loaded in here. Uh, we have everything just as we left it previously, but now we have the bonus of this being hooked up live directly to our, um, our scene. Uh, so any changes that we make here, we will see automatically uh, update live in the scene. Okay, so to start us off, we're gonna use an amazing node called the Instances node. This super powerful thing knows everything there is to know about all of the instances that we're creating. So if there is an instance that is using this particular material, this node gives us information about it. Two things that we're gonna use. The first of which is this output. We're gonna pipe that into the transform, uh, transform uh, a world position, transform input of the world position node, okay? Just like that. So this essentially now is saying, we're now using each individual instance in its original location, which is really, really big. Rather than the original mesh, we want to preserve the locations that we gave it when we created that grid. But now what we need to do is we want that noise to affect each individual instance as a whole. So think of it like this. Think of it like um, we were affecting the vertices of a mesh before. Now what we want to do is think of our whole ocean as one mesh where each individual stud is treated like a, vert a vertex was treated uh, in previously. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this instance ID and we're going to create a quick vector three of that and pipe that into our scale node as the input seed for our uh, simplex Perlin 3D node. So we'll create a, a grab a vector merger node, okay? And we're gonna take the instance ID and we're gonna pass that into X, oops, excuse me, X, Y, and Z, okay? And then we're gonna take the output of this X, Y, Z and pass that right into the scale node. And so now, as soon as we tab over to our other browser, check this out, boom! Wait a minute, not quite done, but we did make progress. We absolutely made some progress with the fact that you can actually see the individual locations are preserved, but we have pancake studs, which of course is not what we want. So let's think about this for a second. What's happening here? What we're doing is we're taking noise value, applying it to each individual um, uh, instance, but we're applying it to every single vertex of each instance. So what we're saying is, though the noise is applied to each instance, we want every vertex to have that same Y value. And so it's flattening it out. What we want to do is take the original mesh shape and add the noise on top of it. So let's do that right now. We'll go back to this and we're gonna just simply go grab an add node, okay? We're gonna drag that uh, over here. We're gonna take the original Y output, okay? We'll add that to, or excuse me, we'll add the uh, simplex Perlin 3D output to that and then that will be piped in to our Y value. And when we do that and we tab back over, we have a moving sea of Lego studs. That is so incredibly cool, so awesome. We're not quite done, we're close. There's one more thing that we're gonna do, which is we want to be able to affect uh, how much turbulence there is or how much displacement there is for that noise. So we're gonna do one final thing back to our uh, node here. We want to multiply the output of this, uh, this noise node by some variable that we can, that we can uh, change, okay? So we'll move add over here. We'll take the uh, Perlin noise and add, uh, 
put that into the right input of the multiply node, and we'll drag out a new float. We're going to call this noise effect, and we'll give it a value of, I don't know, let's say 10, something crazy. And then, of course, that gets piped in to the add node. Now, again, because this is live, we simply tab on over, and look at that super turbulent moving uh, studs. Obviously, probably a little bit much for our taste. So let's go back over and dial this back down something maybe to about three. And that looks pretty good to me. I kind of like that. Um, I think maybe one thing that we could do is we could lighten up the studs just a hair. And of course, we can go back uh, to our base color and we can just brighten that up just a tad to make them look a little bit more like that color of the, of the uh, skybox that's underneath them. So there you go. Uh, before we finally finish here, a couple of things you need to know. We just did a bunch of updates to a live version of the node uh, tree, and none of that is saved yet. You got to do, there's something very important for you to know. You first have to save your node tree. So we're going to go over here in this node material editor and hit save to snippet server, okay? And something magical happens here because there's a live connection between this and your scene. Notice that it incremented our hash and we'll hit okay. And we're gonna go back over and look at this. The place where we had typed in, it automatically updates. The place where we had put in our hash automatically gets incremented because there's that live connection to the scene. But you can't stop there. There's still that one more thing you gotta do, which is all of this code now in the playground, you have to hit save here. So we're gonna do that now create something fun called Lego fun, something like that, and hit OK. And now we have all of our work completely saved. I hope this has been super helpful. I hope you've learned something from this. I hope you've gotten a little peek into the crazy childhood that uh, that spawned the pirate obsession here with, uh, with all starting with a Lego set. Uh, I embrace you to uh, embrace the inner child in you. Uh, share your story of your obsession and nerdery with somebody. But most importantly, I hope that this has been an enjoyable video. In the next one after this, we'll look at how you can actually um, add some logic in to rock that boat, give a little bit of a, a rocking sensation, and we'll get that boat loaded in. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to this channel so that you don't miss any future updates. And uh, we'll see you in the next one.